Hello, it's Bruce Williams again. And it's time for part four of the Selected Gross Pathology of the Rabbit. And we're going to cover the GI tract to include the liver. As I do at the beginning of all of my lectures, I want to thank my colleagues and friends who have provided me images over the years, either directly or through online collections, which allow me to put these lectures together. Okay, talk about the GI system. I don't have anything on pancreas and rabbits. I'm sure they do get something, probably pancreatitis. But uh, we're going to skip that in this particular species. Okay, this is what you don't want to see. Do all your rabbit posts fresh or pawn them off on somebody else. If the rabbit sits over the weekend, the thinness of the linea alba when you make your incision for an autopsy and the usual gaseous distension of the cecum in the rabbit, which lays right under the abdomen, usually makes for an explosive mess. Rabbits tend also to autolyze very quickly because of the high concentration of microbial organisms, protozoa and bacteria within the large intestine. As high in gut fermenters, their cecum will contain 45 to 50 percent of the ingesta in their body at any given time. So be careful with those non-fresh rabbit autopsies. Malocclusion is a significant problem in rabbits as we've seen in some of the other laboratory animals because their teeth grow continually and the incisors of the rabbit will grow up to 20 centimeters a year. Now as opposed to mice and rats there is a significant genetic predisposition toward maxillofacial abnormalities which give rise to malocclusion. Mandibular prognathism has been reported in the rabbit and is reflected as a decreased length of the maxillary diastema or the space between those incisors and the first cheek teeth. This is a, inherited as an autosomal recessive trait with incomplete penetrance so you can have all types of degrees and this is what it looks like. The jaw is just a little too long. The teeth don't meet. Normally there's a bit of grinding which helps keep them down, certainly not enough to keep them worn down, but if they don't meet, then this is a common presentation for these animals. It's not just the incisors, it's also the cheek teeth as well, and you can see that these cheek teeth are overgrown in trapping the tongue. Dietary deficiencies of vitamin D or calcium may also result in malocclusion and ridging of the incisors and the cheek teeth. Okay, we're looking at the underside of the tongue in a rabbit. And the underside of the tongue seems to be a, a predilection site for a number of species to develop oral papillomas as a result of papillomavirus infection. These are specific to rabbits at least this particular one. It's not going to spread to any other species. Rabbits are the only host and it's usually spread by direct contact or oral abrasions, especially in animals less than two years of age. Like many virally induced papilloma, papillomas, these will regress. They have great inclusions in the stratum spongiosum. And People have taken these and inoculated them into other laboratory rodents. And when they're inoculated into hamsters, they cause fibromas. There are a lot of other papillomaviruses that do interesting things when they cross species. Most specifically, uh, bovine papillomavirus 1 or 2, which cause fibroma-like tumors called sarcoids in horses. And this is not a great picture of one of those papillomas, but all these little clear cells within stratum spinosum. If we got a little closer, those would be very typical coilocytes. Another old picture, but unfortunately not a lot of pictures of this particular disease out there. And there are multiple ulcers around the lips and probably within the mouth of this animal. 
and this is rabbit pox virus. Don't confuse papilloma and pox virus. Very different uh, diseases. This one caused by the rabbit pox virus and is characterized by proliferative and necrotizing papules not only on the skin but also throughout the body. Pox viral infections in certain species can be very severe including humans with smallpox, uh, including sheep pox, camel pox, and rabbit pox will do the same thing. Also mouse pox. Um, this is a systemic problem with necrosis in the liver, the spleen, and proliferation in the lungs. And in an outbreak, respiratory signs are often seen. Here are some lesions that look very much like those papillomas, but are actually pox lesions. And if you look closely, you'll see that like most pox, P-O-C-K-S, it is a ring of proliferating virally infected tissue with a necrotic center because that's the oldest part of the lesion. Eventually those virally infected cells are going to rupture and you're going to have a large area of necrosis. This is why I call all pox lesions proliferating and necrotizing blank, whether it's dermatitis, whether it's pneumonitis, whether it's glossitis, as we see here. Here is a set of lungs from a rabbit with pox and you can see that there are a number of areas which often coalesce which you get this proliferative appearance this is epithelial proliferation and in the center of them has a little area of necrosis so you can see this in multiple organs in affected animals and this is a pox virus that has a higher mortality than most trichobezoars Certainly not uncommon in rabbits, especially pet rabbits, sedentary rabbits, rabbits that are bored. They do groom and they will overgroom themselves. They're often seen as incidental lesions, but sometimes they'll get to the size of the entire stomach, whereupon they'll be associated with vague GI signs and weight loss in the affected animal. The weight loss is usually the result of reduced feed consumption. They just can't get any food in there. And the blood work is often absolutely normal. Rarely these animals will die as a, as a result of gastric rupture and peritonitis or simple cachexia. It's often associated with hepatic lipidosis as these animals have to uh, mobilize peripheral fat stores to generate enough energy to supply their metabolic needs. In veterinary school many many years ago I was taught that these animals would respond if you fed them a lot of pineapple because of the digestive enzymes a pineapple would break down the the hairball. Uh, never worked. Enough said on that one. These are, I'll say one more thing, they're surgical problems. You go in, you pull them out, you have a nice little hairball in the shape and the exact size of a rabbit's stomach. But skip the, uh, skip the pineapple. Okay, moving into the small intestine. We have a very congested small intestine, somebody's punctured it here, oops, that uh, um, is full of fluid material with digested food particles. There's really no blood in here, there's no hemorrhage. If this was a pig, you would think about, in terms of bacterial diseases, E. coli. And this is E. coli in a rabbit. E. coli is normally not a part of the flora of suckling or weanling rabbits. Um, as we get into laboratory animals and the rodents and, and species lower in the phylogenetic tree, we tend to have more gram positives, fewer gram negatives in the uh, in the GI tract and usually there's no E. coli in suckling and weanling rabbits so when they get exposed to E. coli especially if you're trying to raise these baby rabbits that you found it is a common cause of morbidity and mortality. The low pH of the stomach and the initial parts of small intestine in rabbits is a barrier to most bacteria so usually you see concurrent disease give rise to uh, to E. coli infections. So if the rabbit has coccidia or rotavirus, which we expect in young animals, it allows for the colonization of E. coli. 
This probably happens as a result of the uh, increase in the pH of the gut when you see concurrent uh, uh, coccidiosis. Rabbits are interesting in that you would expect an enterotoxigenic form in any other species when you see this, but they don't get those. All of the E. coli that have been diagnosed in rabbits are attaching and effacing E. coli. The ones that ultra-structurally cause actin rearrangement to form a very characteristic uh, cup and pedestal uh, attachment site. So the bacteria actually attaches to these cups and pedestals before the whole uh, enterocyte blows up. Usually the kicks, uh, this will kill the suckling rabbits pretty quickly. The weanlings tend to live significantly longer, so you get more extensive lesions including blunting of the villi, infiltration of heterophils, etc. So E. coli, when you see it, look for a predisposing factor as well. Okay diarrheal diseases of rabbits. One of the ones that you need to think about when you see diarrhea in rabbits is Tizzer's disease. Tizzer's disease is big in rabbits and rodents. It is a commensal in the uh, colon of rabbits and rodents and part of the bacterial enteritis complex. Clostridium piliformi, the cause of agent Tizzer's disease, can last for a long time in the environment as well, and the bacteria can be infectious up to a year. Inapparent infections are usually probably pretty common, which are triggered by stress factors such as dietary changes, shipping, or poor sanitation. This is a multi-organ disease in most species, including rabbits. The lesions primarily start in the cecum and colon where the organism lives, and due to some form of dysbiosis, you'll have areas of proliferation, infiltration, and the organisms will proliferate within uh, colonic or cecal enterocytes. Then they will result in necrosis, and they will get into the portal circulation. So the first lesions the areas of hemorrhage and these white areas are probably areas of necrosis within the wall of the colon. Then it gets access to the portal circulation and seeds the liver, where it's just as happy to invade hepatocytes, resulting in multifocal hepatic necrosis. If this is not enough to kill the animal, eventually it will get into the bloodstream and travel to the myocardium, where it will cause a similar lesion. And that's pretty much it. Some animals do survive this particular infection, and you will get circumferential stenosis of the gut as well as stunted animals. This whole picture is characteristic of the large patterns of necrosis that you see. Areas of coagulative necrosis, some areas have been infiltrated by neutrophils resulting in lytic necrosis, and there are some areas where the hepatocytes are still intact. Let's move on to some of the hot gram negatives. And when we talked about the cecum early on, I said later on I'll show you the picture which shows you a great uh, example of the sacculus rotundus, which is the large cecal tonsil at the entrance of the cecum. And the reason this shows up so nicely is because this animal has been infected with Yersinia. Yersinia is a hot gram-negative organism that zeroes in on lymphoid tissue in typically the ileum, the mesenteric lymph nodes, and the spleen in most species, but in rabbits, there a lot of their lymphoid tissue is concentrated in the anterior part of the cecum as well as the long appendix that they have, which is almost all lymphoid tissue. And histologically, if you took a, if you took a cut section through that, you would be hard pressed to differentiate between appendix and ileum. If we had any lymph nodes here, we may have a little bit right here. There's probably necrosis there. Any hot gram neighbor is gonna do this. Francisella tularensis um, is a big one for causing this lesion, but Yersinia um, also will do it in rabbits.
And here's another case of yersiniosis in the rabbit with multifocal necrosis of the lymphoid tissue. And when I am, oh look, here's the sacculus rotundus again. But when I see this in a rabbit, I'm immediately concerned. And I'm going to be thinking about the possibility of Francisella tularensis. And I'm going to quickly make sure that this animal is being posted under a hood and the tissues are sent off for isolation. I have never personally had a case of tularemia um, that I have posted. I keep hoping, but I never seem to get one. And, uh, but just something to be thinking about when you see this pattern, lymphoid necrosis, in rabbits. Here's a disease that we've known about rabbits easily for 50 years and, and don't really still have it all figured out. This is another one that kills the weanling rabbits between 7 to 14 weeks of age. If you've ever tried to raise baby rabbits, they're really difficult. And um, this is a condition that goes by the name mucoid enteritis or mucoid enteropathy. Uh, I hate opathy words, but enteropathy probably better explains the fact that we're not sure exactly what causes this. These young animals generally have bruxism. They're very thin. They stand crouched. They might have diarrhea with a lot of mucus in it. And they often have cecal impaction as well. When you look at these animals, the cecum, the colon, even into the rectum, the enterocytes transform into mucoid secreting cells. And it's not really known exactly um, what the agent is that causes this transformation. It's, it's called, referred to as a cecotroph. It's probably a gram-negative agent. These animals usually have cecal impaction, and the disease has been uh, reproduced by ligating the cecum. An easier way to uh, get it or probably get cecal impaction is just to reduce the amount of dietary fiber that rabbits get. When we deal with the hindgut fermenters, they need a pretty high ration of fiber. And uh, especially guinea pigs don't like to eat their fiber. They really like to concentrate on the sweet feed, on the concentrate we give them. And you have to ensure that these animals are getting a high rate of fiber or you're going to end up with a lot of GI problems. Um, and this is one of them. Not enough fiber in the diet may, in younger animals may lead to mucoid enteropathy. Here is a section from the cecum of an animal, and this is way too many mucoid secreting cells. So there's this un, you know, uncontrolled proliferation of mucus secreting cells, and the, the feces eventually turn into mucus. So when you post these animals, the colon and the rectum will be full of mucus rather than feces. Okay, looking at the, the cecum of a rabbit, and there is hemorrhage. And this is a fairly mild case, but remember, whenever we see hemorrhage, we're going to think about necrosis. This is transmural necrosis, something I probably caused a lot um, when I was a young veterinarian because I didn't have that many antibiotics to work with and nobody knew that much about rabbits. And so if the rabbit was sick, what do you do? You give it a shot of antibiotics. The problem is we've already talked about the high level of beneficial gram positives in the rabbit cecum. And when you kill that off, you allow some of the bad actors to reproduce. And the primary bad actors that are normally happily living in the rabbit's gut are Clostridium difficile and Clostridium spiriforme. So even one injection of penicillin or a number of other antibiotics, including most of the mycins, like erythromycin, lincomycin, um, the MYCINs, not the MYCIN like genomycin, um, will cause enough damage to cause extensive dysbiosis, hemorrhage, and the death of the animal. Just one shot. So you got to be really, really careful about uh, the use of antibiotics. Um, nowadays, people can use Batril without a lot of side effects and avoid this. But it was a common cause of death back in the day. And I'm sure as a young veterinarian, I contributed my share of cases to that body of literature. Okay, 
very dilated cecum with liquid uh, contents and this animal has coccidiosis. Coccidiosis is a common problem especially in rabbit trees or where they raise for fur and meat it's sort of a high turnover and as we said before uh, coccidia causes increased volatile fatty acid production it causes a lowering sorry an increase in the pH of the gut and puts the animal at risk for a number of other conditions uh, including E. coli. There are some very pathogenic forms of uh, coccidia in rabbits including Imeria flavescens and Imeria intestinalis which can cause death in up to 50 percent of young rabbits. Most of the uh, coccidia that you will see with the exception of one that we're going to talk about in a minute are seen in the distal half of the intestine and the cecum they tend to uh, produce large number of eggs and they're fairly easily identified on a fecal flotation. The sexual stage that causes the most damage um, is uh, and results in destruction of enterocytes is when they uh, when the gametocytes hatch out as opposed to the rupture of schizonts in a lo lot of other species. So you get large areas of destruction and necrosis of enterocytes. You get villar atrophy. You get marked infiltration by neutrophils. You can call them heterophils if you want. I don't mind. Just remember, look for those E. coli infections. Do some cultures as well, because usually a couple things going on in these animals. We're looking at the colon of a rabbit. It is thickened. It is wrinkled. And if I showed you this in a ferret, you would say that is Lawsonia. And it is Lawsonia. Um, it affects the ileum. It affects the colon in rabbits. And often, rabbits are a little bit of an outlier because um, the histologic picture is a little different. As opposed to every other species with Lawsonia, um, you do have some necrosis of enterocytes, but you also have a very profound histiocytic infiltrate, almost to the point of looking like Yoni's disease in severe cases. And this is the only species that does this in association with Lawsonia. And if you look in the apical cytoplasm, of the enterocytes, you will see on um, silver stains large numbers of the bacteria, not a difficult histologic diagnosis to make. Okay, we're looking at a couple more things in and around the GI tract. This is not particularly a, uh, uh, a disease of the GI tract, but you see it in the mesentery. And these are the cystocerci of Tinea pisiformis, whose definitive host is the dog or especially wild canids such as coyotes and the foxes and rabbits are intermediate hosts. These are absolutely beautiful cases of Tinea pisiformis. A lot of times what you will see in the uh, in the rabbit is they will be mineralized, they've leaked, there's an inflammatory response and you see degenerate but these are absolutely great Cystocerca, you can see the scolex here. Um, I think these are called strobocerca, I don't, but they are bladder worms. And here's the neck with the scolus right here. And these are about the best pictures you are ever going to see from uh, Western College of Veterinary Medicine. Thank you, guys. We're going to talk about the liver in just a minute, but since we're talking about Cystocircus pisiformis or Tinea pisiformis, the tapeworm folks have decided they want to give the Cystocircus a different name than the adult cestode, and some cestodes even have three different names, so it gets very confusing. But the, these are actually the migration tracks of the immature form of the larva of Cystocircus pisiformis before it develops that nice scolex and so they go migrating through the liver. The reason we can see them so well is because this liver is extremely fatty. This animal is, it could have been starving or very stressed but the fact that it flooded its liver with fat makes it easy to see these hemorrhagic tracts. You can just barely see them in the normal colored liver. Other helminth parasites 
include uh, uh, Passolurus ambiguus. It's a common oxyurid. Everybody have ox has oxyurids, and domestic rabbits are no different. They don't cause much of a problem. They make for nice pictures, um, and they're sort of gross when you uh, open up the gut, but they don't cause any problem for the rabbits. Severe infections in young animals might cause diarrhea, and I guess rarely could cause death, but they're usually not that severe. This one's a direct life cycle, so you're going to see the adults, the larva, and the eggs within the lumen of the gut. And the eggs are a little bit interesting and fairly characteristic because they're morulated, but they're flat on one side. Passolurus ambiguous. To finish up the GI tract with a little bit of mesentery work here. This is a mesenteric lipoma, not uncommon in rabbits. They don't strangulate like they do in horses, um, and especially pet rabbits, they can be pretty common. What they might do is they will twist on themselves and infarct themselves, but they're usually associated with obese pets. Okay, while we're here, we have some important diseases of the liver to talk about. Let's start with a very important disease of rabbits, which goes by a number of names, including rabbit hemorrhagic disease, as you can see here. This is a Khaleesi virus that was first seen in China in 1984, but now is diagnosed all over the world. The genus of the Khaleesi virus is the Lagovirus. It is related to viruses which cause a similar disease in European brown hair and a outbreak a number of years ago, which hasn't been repeated um, in Michigan. This particular virus does not appear to affect cottontails or hares. The animals bleed out. They essentially die of DIC. The liver is totally wiped out. There's no coagulation factors which are produced in the liver, and you'll see hemorrhages in multiple organs, but the virus also attacks endothelial cells and enterocytes as well. It's a, generally a per acute disease. Um, if it only went for the liver, it might take a little longer, but because it has sort of a wide uh, range of attack, to include lymph, severe lymphoid necrosis, it hits the rabbit from a number of uh, different directions. Morbidity in an affected group is up to 80%. And 90% or more of these animals will die. There are a lot of pictures floating around of just piles of dead rabbits. Older animals seem to be affected more than younger animals. The lesion in the, uh, uh, in the hepatocytes appears to be apoptosis, which begins in the central ovular areas and spreads out. But you also have apoptosis of macrophages of lymphocytes and endothelial cells, especially the endothelial cells, likely contribute to thrombosis, to using up all the animal's platelets, and ultimately DIC. One of the earliest signs in the animal is hyperlipidemia. Um, probably due to disruption of hepatic lipid metabolism, sick, sick uh, livers can take in fat, but they can't export it. So the livers in these animals will be somewhat orange, and then they become very pale because the lipidosis changes over to hepatocellular necrosis. You will see hemorrhages throughout, and the lung is a great place to see hemorrhage. There's hemorrhages on the liver and fatty degeneration as well. And it also causes necrosis within the intestine, as well as lymphoid necrosis as well. The lesions in the animal that died, the animals that died in the outbreak in Michigan um, were more subclinical, with only about 30% of the groups affected. And um, the identity of the genome between that particular virus and the classic rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus was only about 80%, give or take. So it is a disease very much like, but not actually, rabbit hemorrhagic disease. 
Okay, another very important disease, especially in weanling and younger rabbits, is hepatic coccidiosis due to Imeria steatae. Older animals will develop immunity, so it's not seen that much in older animals that have survived infection. Morphologic diagnosis is something that's not the most intuitive. Um, I want to have want you to have this canned, so I'll give you the one that I've used successfully for about 25 years, and that is multifocal to coalescing, proliferative and lymphoplasmacytic cholangiohepatitis. And when we look at the histo of this, um, it'll, it'll become somewhat explanatory. But what we're seeing is we're seeing fibrosis of all of these bile ducts. Whenever you see straight lines in nature, I want you to start thinking about pre-existing anatomic structures. And the lungs are often airways. In the liver, they're usually bile ducts. And part of the proliferative nature of this and the chronicity of the infection is that eventually you get a lot of fibrous connective tissue. Now, the disease itself is usually inapparent. However, a certain percentage of these animals will show depressed growth, anorexia, um, diarrhea, and debilitation in the most heavy infections. Other clinical signs may include a pendulous abdomen, um, especially if the animal is going into hepatic failure, a markedly enlarged liver, and blood work will be abnormal. So liver enzymes and ser serum bilirubin may be elevated in the more severe cases. This is another one of those coccidia that will act as a copathogen, triggering various forms of bacterial enteritis, including E. coli and, and some viral infections. This disease is not a benign disease. It's divided into four distinct st stages. The first one is basically just characterized by uh, uh, hepatocyte damage and hepatic dysfunction, which spills over into the blood. The animal is unable to shake off the infection. Then you will get enough change in the bile ducts, and this is a very severe infection, but you get enough change to result in uh, cholestasis with elevated bilirubin levels. And then as the disease progresses into these late stages, you'll get metabolic dysfunction, hypoproteinemia, hypoglycemia, and the animal will ultimately become immunodepressed and not have the, in a, the ability to stop the inevitable progression of this disease to liver failure. Histologically, what you're going to see is tremendous proliferation of these bile ducts, an increase in size, proliferation, a papillary proliferation of the epithelium as the ducts become very dilated, and throughout all of these cells you will see a mix of schizonts, gametocytes of male and female variety, and then within the lumen there are these oocytes. The oocytes will eventually be passed through the bile into the feces where they can be picked up on fecal flotation. So it may be a common disease in the pet trade and in the fur and meat trade, but is not a benign disease and can result in significant morbidity and mortality in younger animals. Okay, one last disease. We've touched on this briefly. This is hepatic lipidosis. Rabbits are one of the species that do get actual pregnancy toxemia. Okay. Uh, the the liver is sort of orange-white due to the excessive uh, mobilization of peripheral fat stores to offset the, uh, the needs of the mother during late gestation, last week of pregnancy, and, and the first week or two of lactation. Rabbit mothers, as we talked about before, are terrible in terms of their mothering habits. They tend only to nurse once or twice a week. So it's primarily what we see in the last week of gestation. These are often primiparous, obese animals that have a lot of fat to mobilize and they'll go off food and uh, you will see ketosis. You may see hypocalcemia and hyperphosphatemia and the blood glucose will range abnormally. 
at necropsy. You'll also see excessive fat in the kidney and the adrenal glands. Usually the animals, as we said, are overweight. And you can even see this in obese rabbits that are just under stress and not having, uh, having babies at the time. Okay, so that covers GI tract and liver. Uh, certainly there's a number of important diseases, especially in the liver, that we've covered. I hope that you've enjoyed this lecture. In the next lecture, we'll move on to the skin, and I look forward to bringing that to you. I hope everybody has a great day.